Hi, just a quick video, check this out. Um, this is a, uh, it's the Ice Cube Digital Optical Neutrino uh, Sensor Module. They're going to manufacture 4,200 of these detectors um, placed in 70 deep ice shafts near the South Pole in a one kilometre cube. Apparently this project dates back to uh, 2004 um, or so. Sorry, I can't get any uh, closer. Well, I can I can zoom in. See some uh, Xilinx FPGAs in there. Lots of flash stuff like that. It'll have a uh, photo multiplier tube for detect and a high voltage uh, board. It's probably up the top there. That'd be what the green cable is there. So um, yeah, photo multiplier to detect uh, neutrinos. And um, of course, you've got to uh, detect. It's got to have a wide dynamic range, so it's got to detect anywhere from one um, lousy little one up to, you know, thousands when there's a, a big event and stuff like that. Those LEDs on top, look at those, just flapping around in the breeze there. And yeah, they're going to manufacture 4,000 of these, so it's got to have a huge dynamic range. It's got to be reasonably low cost. Um, so yeah, it's fascinating. University of uh, Wisconsin are behind this uh, project. And if I can, I'll uh, try and link to some um, to some web pages and uh, stuff for it. But uh, yeah, I don't know why they call it a digital optical module. I guess they sense it optically. I guess um, I don't know how they do that. The cable coming out there. That's just slapping around in the breeze. But uh, yeah, they're going to have 4,200 of these suckers. They would uh, that would be a big, expensive project. Not only to manufacture 4,200, but uh, get them to the South Pole and uh, put them in um, 70, or what is it, um, 70 metre deep ice shafts in a one kilometre cube. That's just nuts. So yeah, a smaller scale project, apparently using like uh, 400 of these, was done in uh, 2004 or something like that. So, or 2005. So, or 70, one was, uh, 70 was the first one, and I guess they got um, favourable results from that. So they decided, yep, they got the budget and funding to uh, do an, EVA, an even more extensive one. So I don't know how something like this would compare to the ones that they've got, you know, the gigantic pools in the underground mine shafts and things like that. I guess the uh, Antarctica would be a better place for it, perhaps. I don't know um, what the deal is, because they put them in, sorry about the focus. Um, they, of course, put them in the like, world's deepest mine shafts and uh, things like that. So. Uh, because you've got to slow those little suckers down and hopefully um, capture one or two because they can pass right through the entire planet. So, yeah, pesky little things, those neutrinos. But uh, anyway, it's got to detect a single flash from the uh, photon as it hits and uh, it converts it um, into... So there'd be a, you know, a killer optical sensor in there. If anyone knows, please leave it in the comments down below if you know details. Looks like it might have an Ethernet interface there and various uh, programming JTAG interfaces for the uh, various FPGAs on these multi-layer boards. So they've obviously split like the functions into uh, the different boards here. So there'd be, you know, processing and uh, I see a big ass um, ovenized oscillator down there. So that's, uh, that'd be for uh, timing and stuff like that. Because you'd have to synchronize all these as well. They would all have to be uh, synchronized. So I don't know if they um, do they wire synchronize them for timing or do they um, RF uh, synchronize them or whatever? I assume, you know, um, in a kilometer cube, something like that, you'd wire them all up, I guess. Um, so maybe that's what the cable is going out, perhaps. The cable goes out and they all join together and they all uh, synchronize them. Not sure how precise the uh, timing has to be for that. Um, you know, a good ovenized oscillator would be good enough, I would suspect. But there you go, that's a. Uh, University of Wisconsin's, um, I assume this is their new model, because it does say they will be placed um, as part of the uh, 40, total of 4,200 of these detectors, so maybe this is a prototype donated by them, and uh, so, you know, final form, uh, well, this would be the final form, I'm sure, but uh, they might have a few bodge wires in there on the final units, who knows, um, but yeah, fascinating, it'd be great if I could actually uh, get one. So if anyone works at the University of Wisconsin and uh, wants to uh, donate one for a, uh, a teardown, that'd be fantastic. Anyway, hope you liked it. Catch you next time. Neutrinos are just like light. The advantage is that even on light is that uh, it's not absorbed.
neutrinos reach us from the edge of the universe. And any individual neutrino can come from, you know, the beginning of time, the beginning of the universe. We are moving into a region that has never been covered by any wavelength of astronomy. There is, of course, always room for surprise. Neutrinos are ghost particles. So they pass right through material without leaving any signs of their passage. They go through walls, they go through the earth, they come out of black holes. Of course, the critical thing is that they have no electric charge, so they are not bent by magnetic fields. So it has a memory, it tells you where it comes from. The problem is then you have to catch them. That one in a million neutrino that eventually stops in your detector, what it does is it interacts with the nucleus in the ice and it makes a little nuclear reaction. That nuclear reaction cre creates charged particles. And these charged particles emit blue light. And so from the light pattern left by that nuclear reaction made by one neutrino, we can reproduce its direction and its energy. So this is a humongous detector in a remote location, a telescope which does not observe light like other telescopes do, but an elusive ghost-like particle from the universe. We would love neutrinos which would have small labels saying, hi, I'm from the atmosphere and I'm cosmic. They do not do that. What we typically have been doing now is to look at events that are so energetic that they cannot be produced in the atmosphere. We just had two of these events, and two events are not approved. There is something there. And eventually we saw more of these huge events, and then we knew this is for real. Each measurement represents a dot in the sky. And so you can think of each neutrino as a dot on a digital map. And if you pile them up, you get a clearer and clearer map with higher and higher resolution. That's the idea. If we ask ourselves what processes in, in the universe are capable of creating particles at these enormous energies, we arrive at the conclusion that there's very few possibilities. Already now, with the first maps of the universe that we are making with IceCube, we may see uh, neutrinos originate from places that no photons escape. We are observing parts of the universe which are inaccessible to standard astronomy. We are now going to add more events to our present map. And so we'll have a better map and God knows what we will see. Could happen tomorrow, it may take the next generation detectors. So what we would like to do is to build an even larger ice cube, something on the order of 10 times larger. The bigger the detector uh, gets, the more neutrinos you see, and in fact, uh, the better you can measure their properties. So you not only get a bigger detector, you get a better detector. There we will get the answer. IceCube is one of the craziest projects uh, in physics, probably in all the science that I, I know. You come to IceCube for science and you stay for the people. The collaboration now consists of uh, about 50 institutions uh, and more than 300 people. We do everything from searching for the highest energy sources out in the universe, and then we can go down to very low energies, we can look for the physics of neutrinos themselves, we can search for dark matter. Working with IceCube and neutrino physics in general mean that you're really working in the forefront of research. We opened a window, but we opened it only for a small slit, and we want to fully open it. We want to chart the landscape. To learn something which no one has learned of before, to see properties of the universe which no one has ever studied before, I think it's the excitement of this, of this field. Without understanding neutrinos, we will never understand the universe. <laughs>